This paper deals not with the better known case of the contest between the two major papal sites, the Lateran and the Vatican, but with the revamping of another site, the Church of Santi Silvestro e Martino ai Monti, whose periodic neglect um, had to do rather with its geographic position within the economy of the city of Rome than to its significance. Although the initial driving force of the project was not the reigning Pope Urban VIII himself, but the then prior of the establishment, Giovanni Antonio Filippini, the papacy got involved via its cardinal nephew, um, Francesco Barberini. In what follows, the focus is on archaeology and images as material evidence for producing indisputable truth. Here, restoring refers both to physically reanimate and to redress as form of correction and embellishment. While systematically assessing these past strategies, it is equally important to reflect on our conclusions in relation to the reasons that generated them. And this brings me to the wording uses and abuses. While it is an obvious quotation of verbal formulas from titles of the post trident period, its adoption in this paper's title targets the irony of criticism, as early modern thinkers often did not shy away from crafting or framing evidence, despite devotedly committing themselves to serving the truth. In the case of Santi Silvestro e Martino ai Monti, the method of work was what can be called in reverse, moving from conclusion to hypothesis and concocting ev evidence in between. The restorations carried out at Santi Martino e Silvestro ai Monti demonstrate consent with the legendary foundation of this particular church by the fourth century Pope Sylvester I and first Christian Emperor Constantine the Great. Um, in 325. While this restoration project was of smaller, smaller scale than other contemporary enterprises at more famous sites such as St. Peter's, it reveals, I argue, that its purpose was to promote claims of primacy importance and implications for the church and for the site in relation to the two traditionally most significant loci of the papacy, the Lateran and the Vatican. It fitted in a larger trend of Christian archeology span in the period and of highlighting the legacy of the first Christian emperor throughout Rome. Relevant information had been perpetuated through the fifth century legendary Acta Silvestri, namely Pope Sylvester's saintly deeds. However, the infamous forged document known as the Donation of Constantine, and you see there an illustration of it, um, still had currency in the period. According to it, Constantine's endowment of the church with powers and regalia similar to the imperial ones, namely with temporal power. At Santi Silvestro e Martino ai Monti, archaeological searches, abusive restorations of ancient images and contemporary imagery were concomitantly deployed to confirm the textually transmitted belief that Constantine had instituted the church. According to 17th century opinions, Constantine's reasons would have lied in the two Roman church councils of 324 and 325 convened by Pope Sylvester at that site, the first of which had been allegedly presided by the emperor himself in his desire to consolidate Pope Sylvester's current dwelling. And you see here Pope Sylvester and the emperor and his mother. As we shall see, the archaeological enterprise built upon these various reasons that, however, brought to the fore two major problems. The validation of the doubtful Roman councils and the establishment of the papal resident as Santi Silvestro e Martino e Monti as the first ever conceded by Constantine to Pope Sylvester. In the 17th century, the mosaic monastic complex belonged to the Carmelites. Its decrepit state urged the prior and later, oops, uh, general of the order, Giovanni Antonio Filippini, to launch its refurbishment in 1635 using his own money. Works lasted until 1675, the year of his death, but the particular restorative effort we look at today ended in 1639. 
Besides these administrative conditions concerned with the presupposed foundation during the time of Pope Sylvester I and Constantine, mobilized Filippini to initiate archaeological searches for material evidence attesting to the existence of the original church. Filippini found an ally in Cardinal nephew Francesco Barberini, who assumed responsibility for restorative works. Filippini penned a minute book on the history of the ecclesiastical complex, which he published in 1639 and predictably dedicated to Cardinal Francesco Barberini. Combining textual and archaeological sources, Filippini paints a euphoric characterization on the import of the church to the spiritual life of Rome. The church is located on the Esquiline Hill. You can see the church there, obviously. Uh, close to the Opian Hill, not far from Tejans, but to the south in the important Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore, to the north, but in an area tangential to the troubled Subura and not heavily inhabited in the 17th century. Like many Roman churches with ancient roots, Santi Silvestro e Martino ai Monti had undergone few different phases of construction throughout centuries, resulting in superimposed architectonic layers that can conserved fragments from former structures, the oldest dating to the second century. However, in the first quarter of the 17th century, the heritage of the first church built on the site was still documentable exclusively through ecclesiastical textual sources. According to some traditional beliefs, the body, the mitre, and the shoe of San Sylvester were arguably interred in the church, but these relics could not suffice to authenticate the presence of a church from the Constantinian time. The most palpable connection remained the dedication of the current church to Saint Sylvester, but even this was somehow muted by its association with that of San Martin of Tours since the fifth century. In addition to the existing church, whose foundation dated back to the end of the fifth century, still extant were the Oratory of St. Sylvester and some rooms used as a living space by the same Pope, both later integrated in the monastic building. Nevertheless, no physical trace supported the belief that Pope Sylvester, thanks to the munificence of Constantine, erected a church there. Illustrious cardinal of the post tridentine reforms as Charles Borromeo and Gabriele Paleotti had been titulars of the church, but their concern had been limited to its renovations, the former focused on the ceiling, whereas the latter on the main doors and the crypt. And for people not familiar with the plan of a church, the crypt is down there. Uh, cardin um, cardinal Francesco Barberini had already shown his profound interest in archaeological matters, sponsoring various projects on early Christian vestiges in Rome, the most notable of which was the Lateran Triclinium, to which we shall return so shortly. In the case of Santi Silvestro e Martino e Monti, the unearthing in 1632 of a silver crown bearing an inscription dedicated to Saint Sylvester forecasted hidden treasures and must have enmeshed Cardinal Barberini into the projects since he immediately sized the crown of, um, for his impressive collection. Unfortunately, I don't have an image of that because it got lost um, in the following centuries. But the revelatory moment came in 1637 with the discovery of the underground rooms adjacent to the church dug out from the left aisle. And this is the space that they um, dug out and the works took place from there. Um, the searches immediately assumed that the space of the old ecclesiastical establishment of Constantine and Pope Sylvester. Although modern scholarship deems these rooms as remnants of an old market hall converted to Christian ritual usage at a certain point as extant decoration implies, in 1637 the rooms constituted irrefutable proof of Constantine's church. Moreover, frescoes and mosaics found in the underground structure at the time of his discovery offered additional evidence. These images channeled Filippini and his peers into inquiring both their initial function and their significance for 17th century believers. Filippini reported that few of his well-informed contemporaries had concluded that the church had been devoted first to the Virgin and then to Saint Sylvester, not only, uh, not long after the Pontiff's death. 
Intriguingly, the thought on the original uh, dedication of the church, based on a particular image, a mosaic showing the Virgin and a pontiff, still fragmentary preserved at the time of its discovery. As Filippini assured the reader, the connoisseurs considered the image without any doubt from the time of Constantine. I quote, those who know how to judge and who have studied these figures and the letters of their names firmly believe that they are from the time of Constantine, end quote. That may not have been an exaggeration. In his manuscript description of Rome from 1650s, Benedetto Melini, who himself was circumspect of the mosaic's date, attested that people concurred in approving its Constantinian age. Similar contemporary understanding of images as material evidence for the historical period when a building must have been founded and embellished emerges from descriptions of the chapel of San Silvestro um, at Santissimi Quattro Coronati uh, in Rome. Ottavio Panciroli, in his Treasures in Tesori of 1600, and later Pompo, um, Pompilio Totti in his Portrait of Modern Rome of 1638, both noted that the chapel's ancient frescoes demonstrated that the church had been built by Constantine and Pope Sylvester, when in fact that they, they dated to the, not to the fourth century, but to the 13th century. But back to the Virgin from Santi Silvestro and Martini ai Monti, questions raised whether Filippinis and since uh, his circle's criterion of adducing visual evidence entailed the same principle of differentiation among strata of historical remnants and the recollection that made them seek for the earliest church in the first place. The mosaic above and not in a niche shows the Virgin looking out, so it was initially in here, and they moved it up there. The mosaic above and not in a niche shows the Virgin looking out and blessing a pontiff of a noticeable smaller scale. The Pope wears the older version of the tiara featuring just one crown. The three beasts display on the decorative edges of the mosaic indicate the involvement of the Barberini whose coat of armed bees represent, if not entirely in designing the work, at least in its restoration. Since the catacombs of the church were associated with the founder of the first establishment there, Pope Sylvester I, the pontiff receiving Madonna's blessing was thought to show, as Filippini confirms, Sylvester. Nevertheless, there is more to learn from Filippini. The mosaic visible nowadays is a reconstruction commissioned by Francesco Berberini. The cardinal nephew had similarly acted with regard to another mosaic involving St. Sylvester, the one on the Lateran Triclinium. In both cases, Francesco Borromini employed Giovanni Battista Calandra. Calandra was acquainted with the Barberini from whom he received uh, both official and private commissions as well as his appointment as the chief mosaicist of St. Peter's in 1629. When Francesco Barberini had supported the triclinium renovation in 1625, no trace of the original mosaic could be seen in the upper left corner of the structure. Um, what may have seemed an inconvenience had been redressed by supplanting a perfectly meaningful image in lieu of the perished mosaic. Pope Sylvester and Constantine flanking Christ here. With Constantine on this side and St. Sylvester. Although advertised as a truthful replica of the original mosaic known through a drawing miraculously stumbled upon, it is a Barberini invention as Ingo Herzog has already revealed. Similar abusive uh, methods in the service of truth characterize the reconstruction of the underground ambient at Santi Silvestro e Martini. There, the mosaic's location was changed from within to above the niche. According to Filippini, the mosaic faithfully reproduced the faint model which, despite its state of decay caused by many lost tessere, still conserved the underdrawing allowing the restorers to translate it truthfully. Nevertheless, some aspects of Filippini's language when this, describing the image seem contradictory and intensify questions about the vouch veracity of reconstruction. 
whether his comment on the Virgin as standing and on St. Sylvester as kneeling in the old mosaic reflected its state before the conservation or intended not to cause confusion when compared with the replacement, but rather to grasp an aesthetic of scale different specific to the past remains an open question. A vanished epigraph loading the successful restoration and its promoter, uh, Cardinal Francesco Barberini, stood once near the mosaic. However, its role was not only to sing prizes, but also to equate unquestionably the depicted pontiff with Saint Sylvester and to emphasize his unique relationship with Constantine. The degree of accuracy in recreating the mosaic from Santi Silvestro and Martino Aimonti, as well as the identification of the pontiff with Saint Sylvester, are obviously questionable. But the argument here lies in how this image was transposed, understood, and presented to believers immediately after the discovery of the underground church. Archaeology, though palpable, did not suffice in demonstrating the Constantinian foundation. The Barberini bees attached to the mosaic um, connote not only sponsorship, but also, like seals, warranty of truth. Reading Benedetto Melini's almost contemporaneous notes on the church, one understands that Filippini and Cardinal Barberini's mission was not necessarily facile, though enforcing. Melini voiced his doubts about equating the pontiff with Saint Sylvester based on the type of the tiara that could not pertain to the papacy of St. Sylvester. For the discoverers of the underground church, the mosaic embodied material evidence necessary to prove the existence of the church constructed by Constantine for St. Sylvester. To the same goal, they affixed an epigraph meant to vanquish distrust. A chain of proofs alimenting each other's veracity emerges. Images attached to the walls guaranteed the antiquity of the building that hosted them. However, not only the church in its physicality, but also Pope Sylvester's residence needed to be justified. However, together they formed that sort of nucleus for a papal residence later developed at the Lateran and the Vatican. Although Pope Sylvester had lived at the site of uh, Santi Silvestro and Martino Aimonti before the construction of the Constantinian Church, Constantine's recognition of papal authority qualified this residence in a temporal dimension. Even in this new acquired state, this dwelling preceded Constantine's establishment of the first official papal residence of imperial derivation, the Lateran. Thus, Santi Silvestri, uh, Silvestro and Martini e Monti was ahead of the Lateran and immune to the contests between the latter and the Vatican. From the restorer's perspective, we must recognize their acumen and quality of execution. They identified the causes and motives and conducted their research in reverse from an argumentative approach so that to provide indisputable material evidence. From our perspective, their abusive restoration led to a splendid instance of intellectual history that cannot be solved without the help of images. It is even more relevant when considering that it involved crucial historical figures whose social political impact has not stopped being felt until the present day. This paper has restored the truth about the restoration process and brought to light the claim for Santi Silvestro e Martino e Monti to residential primacy among papal sites. Later images, also from Father Filippini's tenure, confirm this hypothesis, but this requires another lecture. Thank you very much.